So right at 6.30 on the dot. Kelsey's yeah. here. We have Kelsey, Jane, thanks for joining us tonight. Let a few people join in. Daniel, <clears> hi. <throat> We're not expecting too many people tonight, but um, we will have a few folks presenting. So happy to have all of our attendees on the screen after we have the presentations and we can kind of just have a discussion, a Q&A, and this shouldn't be too long. Don't expect longer than 30 to 45 minutes. I, um, my name is Amanda Farnay. We spoke over email, so thanks again for taking the time to Yes, come. sure. No, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad I could be here, even yeah. if it's virtually. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I know. That's the motto these days. But we'd love for the commissioners who are on just to introduce themselves as well. And then we'd love just to hear a few updates from your side, and then I can open it up to a quick Q&A from everybody else. Sure, sure. Great. Danny, do you want to give a or Dan, Commissioner Winston, do you want to give a quick say hello, where you represent, and what's what's going on? Sure. Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Commissioner Dan Winston. Dan, uh, I'm in Mumbai 12, the area around 14th and U Street. Glad to be here uh, on this morning. Hey, guys. I'm Danny Delaney. Uh, I'm not Dan. Um, I'm the commissioner for 1B10, just north of uh, Howard. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Awesome. Thanks, both. And yeah, um, Lieutenant Chambers, I will just kick it back over to you. Would love to hear any updates you'd like to share with our community, and then I'm sure we have sure. some. Sure, sure, absolutely. Just wanted to again uh, say good evening to everyone. If uh, I didn't get my name out there, it's Lieutenant Jennifer Chambers. Um, actually assigned to PSAs three and two, 302 and 304. So 304, um, the kind of western part of this ANC is part of my boundaries because um, I have like the 16th Street north to like Gerard, Harvard up there. Um, so that's part of my patrol sector. Um, many uh, people may know that we're doing the summer crime initiative. So that some of that area to include um, Fairmont, and um, Columbia and University and Clifton, all that's part of our uh, summer crime initiative, which has given us a targeted area within our community to place additional resources in order to combat violent crime and ensure that we're getting resources to the community that may be um, needed or may not have otherwise been offered based on crime trends that have happened over you know previous summers. So um, part of your ANC is included in that SCI is the acronym that we use. So um, we're, we're doing a lot of things um, with that, which are, which are great within the community. Um, so I can t hit a little bit on that as I speak. And if I talk too fast, please let me know. I've, I've been doing so many things today. I'm kind of like speeding through my day. No, this is um, great. Thank you. <laughs> no, I talk quick. So if I, if I do too much, just, just slow me down and I'll, I'll come back to something. Um, so uh, regarding some crime trends that have happened over the last couple weeks, I just wanted to touch uh, on a few things that have particularly affected our this uh, AMC 1B. Um, there has been throughout the city, which has affected several districts, um, a, a carjacking, if, if anyone's familiar with the carjacking, which is when someone gets forcibly removed from their car and their car gets stolen from them, um, kind of like a trend that that's that used to be really big in the 90s, but for some reason it's coming back, where someone will tap the rear bumper of a car, and then when the driver gets out to look at the damage or assess, someone will jump in and drive the car away. Um, we've noticed, we've detected a pattern of some thefts that have occurred around the city, and one of those thefts occurred within this uh, ANC on the 19th of June, and that was in the 1400 block of Belmont. I don't remember what car was stolen, but essentially, um, the bad guys or girls, the bad folks, are working in tandem with each other, and sometimes they have, um, sometimes it's just one car, but sometimes it's multiple cars. We've seen instances where, like, one of the, the cars will, like, kind of cut off in front of a driver, and then another car might tap the bumper, and then when the driver gets out, somebody jumps in 
and takes the car. Um, a lot of the cars have been higher end cars that we're noticing. So a lot of the more expensive um, higher end luxury cars, SUVs, um, it hasn't been discriminatory as far as whether it's a particular model. So we just wanted to put it out to the community to just always be cautious and safe um, when you're operating your motor vehicles because we don't want anyone to, you know, try to take advantage and create a fake crash that would ultimately try to steal their car from the community. So that's something we would just wanted to get out there. Um, they do have the, the issue that we're running into with this particular crime trend is that the, the bandits, I hate to use that term, but the bad guys and gals, they're, they're using stolen cars to steal cars. So that's kind of been the, um, the difficulty for us as we're investigating because they're dumping cars and getting new cars and it's just always so fluid. But um, we always welcome any information if anybody sees anything or knows any information, they can always provide that to us to assist us with the investigations on those. Um, another item I, w I noted in our crime report was that there was a couple stolen vehicles that were not related to this carjacking thing, uh, robbery. Um, what we're seeing is that a lot of times members of our community or um, Uber delivery folks or um, some people maybe run into 7-Eleven and they'll leave their car running. Um, this becomes a crime of opportunity for people who are passing by and will just jump in the car and steal it. So we're seeing a, a kind of an uptick in that as well. I don't know if folks, because of the weather, they're keeping the air conditioning running or what they're doing, but a lot of uh, reports that we're seeing are folks that are leaving the car running, hopping out to do something, and by the time they come back, their car has been stolen. So another thing that we just want to remind the community is to always secure your vehicle because we don't want to present um, just crimes of opportunity for people who are going to see a running vehicle and just, you know, take it. Um, Theft from autos are the same thing with people breaking into cars. Uh, not very many of these have been reported in this ANC for this last week, I think is, or, yeah, it's a weekly crime trend that I read. So we didn't have very many. I think there was maybe two, one or two within the ANC. But again, it's um, reminding the community to not leave valuables in plain view that may tempt someone who's walking by and, and could smash a window and grab an item is, you know, anything of value, whether it's cell phones or, you know, packages, something that could be, we always, always recommend um, storing any items of value in your trunk or glove compartments and doing that prior to arriving to your destinations because criminals can be anywhere. And we do, I've always, like I used to tell my mom, whenever she would travel, she would always put her trunk in or her purse in the trunk when she would get to like the shopping mall. And I would say, mom, please, somebody's watching you put your tr your purse in the trunk. And once you go in the store, they're going to steal your purse. They know that's where you put it. So before you leave the house, why not put your purse in the trunk? And then when you get there, they don't see you go to your trunk. Um, so that's just an, another uh, helpful safety tip that we try to remind the community um, when it comes to storing their valuables in their vehicle. Um, little issue, too, were the theft of packages. There was a couple, I want to say, again, not very many reported in this one, uh, ANC, but there may have been uh, one or two theft of packages, which again, um, I, I'm also a city resident, so I I know the convenience of having packages shipped to our homes, but sometimes it may be better if we're going to be at work or out and not at home on a day that a package will be delivered to maybe have an alternate address. Um, sometimes Amazon and other delivery services have now remote accesses to where they can either open your house or put it in your car or, you know, something like that. So we always recommend but then, of course, that goes back to the other issue I was talking about with, you know, potential thieves seeing, you know, packages going into your vehicles. But at least the car would be locked. Maybe you'd be good with that. But uh, trying to protect packages, just not leaving them on the porch would be helpful. Or maybe I built a good rapport with my UPS delivery guy. I live on um, – over in Northeast, and I actually introduced myself to my UPS guy and said, hey, here's my phone number, maybe we can coordinate. He was really good about calling me when he was about to deliver a package so I could make sure I intercepted it. So that's something I always encourage too. It's a good way to meet a neighbor and somebody who's working in the community and you can know your UPS guy or your FedEx guy or girl. Um, 
fireworks has been a big issue lately. Of course, we're approaching the 4th of July, so we have a lot of calls for service and a lot of complaints about these excessive fireworks that are obviously not legal in our community. And we, um, unfortunately, we can't control what people are buying and bringing into the city. So what we have done at the 3rd District is we have implemented um, it sounds silly, but they're called firework cars. And basically it's patrol officers who are designated as firework patrol vehicles. And anytime we get a call for service for fireworks or anytime they're patrolling and they observe fireworks, their focus is to respond to that location and attempt in every way to confiscate the illegal fireworks. Because once we can remove the fireworks, hopefully we can <laughs> curb, again, the noise that's happening in our communities leading up to the 4th of July. So I think that was all the notes that I had written down for things, but I'm welcome to taking questions or anything that may be of concern in the community that I can address for you guys. Thanks a lot, Lieutenant Chambers. Um, really appreciate you being here. Uh, I know it's uh, it's tough to be covering a district that you don't necessarily spend a ton of time in. A um, couple of questions, and if they need follow-ups um, for um, other members of the force, that's that's fine, and feel free to say so. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, I'm going to write them down. Um, so if I can't answer, I will absolutely get that answer for you all. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so. Uh, first question, um, we, we're still seeing a lot of activity um, with the marijuana pop-ups, um, particularly on Georgia Avenue. Um, there's one right on the corner of Georgia and Columbia that's been um, pretty highly trafficked over the last couple of months. Um, it hasn't gone off lately, but there have been a couple of shootings in that area um, uh, basically since the pandemic started. Um, have you guys changed any of the practices that you um, have around um, tracking down, closing, um, identifying those those pop-ups in the district? Well, we do, the, the technique that we have been using, and unfortunately for us, a lot of times, um, if we don't have the intelligence, which pop-up parties, they usually have their clientele's they're not advertising on social medias because they don't want the police to know. So a lot of their clientele is they handle through text messages or private chats. Um, so many times, I'm not going to say all the time, but many times the police, the, the pop-up party has popped up when we're notified. So once we're notified, what we've been doing is making sure that um, essentially we shut it down with some legal resources we're not able to just bust up into people's you know private residences or businesses but we have developed some you know tactics and techniques that assist us with conducting the investigations which typically involve you know um, maybe just contacting people as they're leaving the establishment I know there was a pop-up party on Florida Avenue which I don't believe is in this ANC but um, we were able to obtain search warrants and successfully retrieve additional uh, drugs and weapons from this particular residence. So um, I, I can get information on this particular one at Georgia and Columbia, but I haven't heard of anything recently that's um, been done as far as um, investigatory stuff, if that helps. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I want to, I just want to flag it. Um, I mean, uh, I, I just know it's been it's been a contentious part of the of the neighborhood uh, where I represent. So, um, uh, sure, I'll just flag it for the for the captain that um, is in charge of this uh, this district. That'd be great. Sure. Um, yes. Second question I have um, the uh, the fireworks that you guys are seeing set off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it it seems like, as far as I can tell, it's because people are bored. Um, are you seeing other people? Are you seeing other uses of the fireworks or people shooting the fireworks at each other? I mean, that's we have like received, problem. yeah, we have received calls for service uh, for that. You know, typically it's like the bottle rocket types where, you know, the kids, young kids will be, you know, shooting them at each other. Um, we haven't received calls of, I mean, of course, every incident is serious. I'm not trying to say that, but significant people throwing, you know, massive fireworks at other people. Um, it's more, and, and I agree, I think it's more boredom and, you know, child horse playing type 
uh, situations. Uh, but again, that's something that, like I said, with implementing the fireworks dedicated vehicle, and actually, I believe this coming up this at the end of this week, we're going to have two mobile vehicles because right now we kind of just have one, kind of roving and trying to get the fireworks, and we have confiscated a few. I no noticed them down in the station today. I was really excited to see that we have actually confiscated quite a bit of the illegal fireworks. Um, so we're we're trying, we're doing what we can, and and it does take. You know the community letting us know because we have a system in place and you all may have heard of the shot spotter system which helps us detect gunshots in the, in the community and helps us pinpoint it with more geographical accuracy sometimes fireworks are not detected because the de the system of shot spotter is not detect is not designed to detect fireworks but sometimes it will come through um, when they the system may recognize it and say possible fireworks. Um, so when we get those, we're able to be dispatched immediately if the community doesn't call because it pops up on, you know, the comp through the computer. Um, so again, just having the community help us uh, when the fireworks are going off is is always great. Just by calling 911 and making sure we just say, hey, we got fireworks going off, and like I said, we'll send the car over. And, and our goal is to make sure that we confiscate the ones that are awesome. out there. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Danny, sure. do you have any other questions? Awesome. I was just going to ask along the lines, Crystal, thank you so much for um, your questions on budget and other specific things regarding MPD. But I did want to ask, Lieutenant, if you have anything specific that I, I'm just interested in the um, perspective of the internal like when you go to work every single day, I know everybody is working so many more hours on the force and how you start your day and how you all are approaching policing the protests. And if we can get that insight from your side. And then I have gotten a lot of general inquiries about the Swan Street incident. I know it is not specifically in our 1B area, but would just love any um, information that you can share on that. Sure. Um, I am actually assigned to the patrol section of things, so I'm not part of the uh, protesting information. So I don't have a lot of intelligence on that. That would be something that I would need to maybe get with Commander Emmerman on or maybe one of the yep. uh, other officials who would have definite information, especially as it pertains to Swan Street. I was working that night, um, but I don't, you know, by reading what's on Popville versus reading what's, you yeah. know, on Facebook, I, I, w I would rather make sure I get accurate information that might be able to be helpful. Um, so let me see, I'm writing this down on my notes here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we, I know. Now, uh, specifically uh, regarding Swan Street, because or what, what kind of information are we looking for with that incident? Because, I mean, there was a couple versions. I know the, the there's the media version, and then there's the police department version. So I don't know. Are we like trying to corroborate the media version? Or are we trying to quell the media version? Yeah. Just really okay. just trying to understand um, from anyone who was there that night or any anything that is has been a follow up if there's an internal investigation if there's any further information on what actually happened I know we have footage from police and from protesters but would love any further you know insight that I can share with folks that's public sure um, what I would have to do is regarding those questions I would have to speak with someone who was there or at least one yeah. of the officials who would know the answers to those yeah. questions because I don't yeah. have that information and I would not want to give you any misinformation on that so that's something I wrote here to follow up on myself so let me see Perfect. No, thank okay. you so much for And then I think that. we talked, sure. And then there was another part of your question too, prior to Swan Street. Um, what was the other oh, part? Just the perspective of um, internal like communication on how you all approach each day policing protests. Sure, sure. So what, we, what we've had recently is a full department activation, which means the chief of police has uh, implemented every officer that is assigned to the police department to be working in their official capacities. So um, there are numbers of officers who are assigned to the protest portion. There are numbers of officers who are still assigned to the patrol portion, which is like what I'm doing. Um, we have 
every member is working, like I said, all shifts. So we have the resources that we need in order to handle the 911 calls as well as handle the demonstrations that are downtown. Um, I haven't been able to watch a lot of the news, but I've been hearing from my counterparts that a lot of the uh, demonstrations downtown have turned violent, um, very aggressively, I think, um, I don't want to say degrading or demeaning, but a lot of the um, activists are throwing like urine and you know horrible things at the officers. Um, so it's it's been a little challenging down there. But again, everything uh, we're doing everything we can down there within the you know reasonable you know uh, uses of force and things like that are are not being used. We're down there. We're really trying to negotiate and de-escalate the situation down there and and listen to the folks that are rightfully trying to voice their concerns. Um, so on the patrol side, we still have officers running this. You know. I, I hate to talk in police talk. So they're still answering all the calls for service and they're working, you know, every day doing everything. So, I, I mean, we're, yeah. we're here and we're doing our job. And I mean, as far as the internal stuff, I mean, yeah. I'm pretty proud of us. <laughs> I'm pretty yeah. proud of how we're handling things. Lieutenant Chambers, one question for you. Um, given everything that's happened, is the, is MPD taking any, um, any steps to, um, audit uh, the internal use of force uh, amongst MPD and um, and change any policies or practices in light of what's happened. In light of what's happened with which specifically? The, the demonstrations, the um, the reactions to George Floyd's death um, and, and how it's, it's shaping the conversation about police. And sure, sure. No, that's a great question because um, I can tell you, I've been with MPD now for almost 19 years, actually, it'll be 19 years in July. Um, so I've been around a very long time. And I can say that I, I can't speak on what policies are being audited. That's not something that's in my purview. But what I do know about the Metropolitan Police Department, and I, and I take such great pride in being a member of this police department and working in this city, is that we have some of the most progressive uh, use of force policies, um, de-escalation training, sensitivity and diversity awareness training, um, you know, just even with our special liaison units, I, I can't think of very many police departments. I mean, maybe NYPD or LAPD, but there are not very many, many police departments in this country that are able to engage so many ethnically or um, just diverse communities. And it's it's so I find it extremely, um, I, I don't, I don't want to say, uh, I'm very proud to work for this police department because I think we had started our use of force model of training and de-escalation and everything. At least when I came on the job, we were training in that way. We don't do chokeholds. We don't do the things that are reported from a lot of the other police departments. Um, so I take pride in the fact that our officers are trained I think as be the best officers in the country. I mean, I mean, I'm not just saying that because I work here, but I, I really believe that the Metropolitan Police Department is way beyond many police departments. And I do agree as a resident, as a police officer, that reform is needed. It's needed nationwide, but I'm proud to work for a police department that kind of started that reform before the conversations ever started. And we've been trained in these techniques for years. And so it's, it's something that I find, you know, very prideful about. And I just uh, hope the community can know that based on our general orders, which are, all of our general orders are online, they're free, or not free, well, they are free, but they're open to the public because, you know, we don't hide um, aside the ones that are internal only, like our undercover operations isn't going to be something that we're going to put up to the public. But, um, you know, our use of force policy is, is right online. You can, anyone can access what our policies are. And um, I, I just think we've just been ahead of the curve. And it's unfortunate um, that other agencies around the country have not caught up to that because I think that's kind of why we are where we are today with the law enforcement community relations. But um, I just hope that in our city and in our community, we can continue to work and build the bridges and 
you know, kind of fill in those gaps and, and do everything that we need to do to maintain the community trust because that's so important to us. Great, yeah, thanks absolutely. so much. Yeah, thanks sure. Lieutenant Jen, uh, Chambers. Sure. Commissioner Winston, did you have any uh, questions or follow-up questions or anything? Um, you know, uh, I do, but I think not not for this not not for this forum. I, I want to hear the other 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 folks who are here. We have some questions in the um, comments in the chat. Uh, yeah, I think I think. One, thank you to everyone who is sharing in the chat and Crystal and Daniel really just thanks so much for sharing your stories and your experience. Um, I do think that one thing, the last thing that I will ask Lieutenant Chambers is just about the use of tear gas and pepper spray. I think that's something that DC Council has uh, considered in their emergency legislation and sure. getting the use during using that emergency legislation. Do you, do you agree with that? And and just, I'm sure I know when you're trained, you have to be pepper sprayed so you know what that right. feels like. Right. So would love your That's perspective. Yeah. Sure. Well, the, the emergency legislation is um, honestly already the verbiage that we on the Metropolitan Police Department use. We don't use tear gas, pepper spray, sting balls, any types of use of force on peaceful protesters. That's not a policy we've ever had. Um, when we have to deploy anything of a crowd management level, it's because we have um, rioters, protest, not protesters, rioters or, you know, criminal acts happening that need to be quelled in a way that these tools are done to not to create the least amount of bodily injury yes it's uncomfortable pepper spray is uncomfortable but it's not deadly and it's just a tactic that we can use um because if anyone I, I know we've been working for so many days but um if we think back to when this first started in our city um, many of us, at least in my time, I don't, I wasn't here during the Mount Pleasant riots in the, in the mid to late 90s, so I don't recall that uh, situation. I had to Google it so I could see kind of what the, you know, how long those riots lasted and, and the damages that were done and the businesses that were affected and the residents that were displaced and, and things of that nature because I wasn't here then. But this event is uh, like unprecedented times for all for many of us that are still on the police department. But um, we do not have a, any policy that's going to use force on anyone who's ex exercising their constitutional First Amendment right. I mean, this city is is known. Our police department takes tremendous pride in hosting so many peaceful demonstrations hundreds of times a year. We have so many large scale uh, events in this city that our police department, working along with Secret Service and Park Police, we absolutely afford people who live here and people who visit here a platform to be able to air their grievances against the government. And we believe that that's something that people should be able to do in the safest way possible um, as it pertains to using, like I said, tear gas or anything against peaceful people. We don't do it. It's just, it's not a policy. It's not anything that we do. Um, I can't speak on what another agency would do or what was portrayed in the media at another situation, but I can say that the Metropolitan Police Department has no policy in place that would ever, ever go against allowing anyone to have their First Amendment right to protest peacefully. Thank you so much. Sure. Any last thoughts or questions from anyone on screen or specific questions from the audience that I can ask? If anything comes up later in our discussion, I can always follow up with Lieutenant Chambers here. And then I know Commander Armin, he always has lent his phone number and everything here. That's right. That's right. Lieutenant. And I do have the uh, notes that I'll follow up to. And, and Amanda, is it okay yeah. if I just email you? Absolutely. And the, the group, the, the, the uh, 1B group that I guess yeah. was on the email that I received. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Exactly. Lieutenant. And I'll, I will share. Yeah. Um, will, will Commander Emmerman be at the uh, ANC meeting uh, next month? I uh, he should be. Confirm with him, but yes. Yeah, he should be. Um, I know he has a meeting tonight. I think there's an ANC meeting tonight at seven that he's handling. Yeah, he has the uh, CAC, which is the, the CAC. Action. That's right, the CAC. 
There's so many acronyms we know. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Well, thank you for being here, Lieutenant. Uh, we really sure. appreciate your time. And, no, and I yeah, do. And I, will... I appreciate you all taking the time to allow me to ramble too. I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, my email is the best way to get me. But if there's any questions anytime, please do not hesitate to, to reach out to me. I would gladly be able to assist, but any way I can. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for sharing. I saw that Crystal has had to leave because she's representing. Uh, but, Daniel, I will definitely – here, I'm going to promote you two panelists now. And I'd love to go through and just have – Kelsey and Justin, who we have on from the Long Live Go-Go movement, introduce themselves. And then, Daniel, if you're here representing Sunrise, would love for you to introduce yourself as well. Kelsey, if we want to start with you. Hey, guys. I'm Kelsey. I serve as the executive director of Long Live Go-Go. We are the producers of the Mo Chello Valleys that have been sweeping 14th and U. Um, we've also done other activations around the city just advocating for issues that are meaningful to our community, uh, respectively the African American community and like underdeserved communities in DC. Um, we currently are advocating for DC statehood. So um, tomorrow we'll be doing a small activation around that hearing that will be held tomorrow in the Senate. Um, and I do 51. thank you all for uh, coming out and helping us out on Friday. I know you guys were essential uh, help on Friday. You guys were able to pass out hand sanitizer and try to make it the most uh, cleanly event as possible. So I appreciate you guys. I know we're going to make this a long-term partnership. So I can't wait to see what that looks like. And I do thank you all for taking the time this evening to chat with us. Perfect. Yes. Thank you Justin so much. Justin introduce yourself. Yeah, no yeah Justin. Great. Hello everyone, my name is Justin Johnson, also go by Yada Ya. I'm the founder of Long Live Go Go. Um, as Kelsey said, the producers of Mochella and many other activations around the city. And one thing I really pride ourselves on, well, one thing we really pride ourselves on is being able to utilize the culture to influence our community to be more politically engaged and to get more active. And I think since last spring we've seen a lot more of that and that's a trend that we're definitely proud of so we definitely like to use go go which is what i think is a symbolic term of dc culture not just a genre of music as a mobilizing tool but also a form of messaging um, to kind of put everything into the to layman terms for the community essentially and thanks awesome. for your support last Friday. We appreciate it. You all were the ones with the hand sanitizers, correct? Yes, exactly. Well, Commissioner well, we, Winston, who's on with me, he was there as well. So we got to really talk to a lot of folks. It was such a good turnout, too. And everyone was wearing a mask, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> Wear your PPE. It's strongly, strongly recommended. Absolutely. And then, Daniel, do you, do you want to give a little um hello and what you do for sunrise i don't know if i've had the pleasure of meeting you yet so nice to meet you yeah no we haven't met yet um thanks for having us here um so yeah i'm with sunrise we're um a national climate change movement with um hubs spread out throughout the entire united states um, the dc hub is several hundred members strong right now over 500 um, <clears throat> we we're here because we've we and all the other climate change movements in dc have essentially pivoted all of our resources and focus towards social justice um, this is because social justice is climate justice and climate justice is social justice there's this whole concept of environmental intersectionalism about how they're intertwined but you know the people who are most adversely affected by environmental issues or the socially and racially disenfranchised and in turn, those people can't help make change in the climate movements because they're too busy focused on preserving their lives and their livelihoods in a way that many of us don't have to. Uh, so for that reason, you know, it's not really worth saving the world if it's not a world worth saving. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, we all want the planet to thrive and be successful, but we have to make it a good planet to thrive and succeed on. Um, so we, we always try and incorporate 
these principles into the climate change work we do, but right now we need social justice. And so we're here in full support of everything that um, the Black Lives Matter movement is. We're looking for and looking for change in our local community in DC. Awesome. Well, thank you, Daniel. Thanks for sharing. Um, would love to go back to the Long Live Go Go folks, Justin and Kelsey, and just hear about what you're advocating for in the long, short term and long term. I know that you have put out some plans specifically around budget. Um, we're considering as a full ANC what we want to further recommend. We have made recommendations to the budget already, but we are hosting our July meeting and doing further recommendations specifically for MPD budget and then further. So we'd love to hear from you all on that. And just anything else, I know that you're involved in uh, a movement for the DCPS. Um, yeah, just anything you'd like to share. And then Daniel, we'd love to hear more about what you all have been doing this week and then plan for the next few months in DC specifically. No. Okay, I'll take the lead. So um, as far as the budget, we are demanding as far as the list of demands that we deliver to the DOJ, MPD, and um, DOJ, MPD, and City Council. Uh, two weeks ago, we asked them to divest the 21 proposed 19 million increase from MPD and invest it in a vibrant Black futures. Specifically, that money will be allocated by $9 million to support violence interruption work, $8 million toward local community youth-led or focused organizations, and $2 million to one-to-one -one mentorship for low-income students in D.C. Awesome. Justin, do you want to add anything to that or just anything that you have been hearing in your own conversations in the community? Yeah, for sure. I mean, even to add on to expand on that list, we were talking about them declaring racism a public health crisis. Um, we were talking about MPD having to bear the cost of misconduct, basically deeper and more in depth investigations. But a lot of a lot of what I've been talking about with a lot of people I know in the community is some type of community liaison or something that we could put in place to give the police more of a relationship with the community. I think that's a, a big aspect that's missing. I think the the cops are there to protect and serve, but they don't really understand the community that they're protecting and serving. So I think that's there's a huge void there. And having someone that can kind of play the middle, the middle and really hold uh, the police department accountable, but also really understand what's going on in the neighborhood. I think that would be smart to put something, some type of liaison position in place there, I think that could be extremely helpful to kind of restore that sense of community, build that bridge with the police department, but also just make everyone more comfortable. I think there's a lack of understanding between the people in the community and the police department, and that's where you have like a huge um, disconnect. So it's kind of like every interaction is like a lot of tension there, where I think um, the whole stigma behind the, the police department has, it, can, it can change, and I think if it does change, that will um, highly affect the, the police brutality within the community and, and all the other, you know, toxicities that, that are kind of plaguing all uh, Black communities around the nation and world, you know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Any questions from so commissioners? No, but it's great to hear that you guys were uh, that you guys are sending those recommendations over to city council. Um, Brianne Nadeau is obviously a council member um, in this district um, and this ward, um, so she might be a resource um, for you to reach out to as well. Yeah, just like make make a couple comments. First, thanks everybody for for being here uh, at, at this meeting, um, and, and especially when we're talking about this topic, I, I find myself thinking, "Gee, it'd be great if we could be in person." Um, <laughs> right. so something as important as this, I mean, truly like, um, we do, you know, I do a lot of transportation stuff, there's other things on zoning and that's more dry and technical sometimes, but this is really what matters. Um, and, uh, I look forward to, you know, all of us being able to come together at some, at some point in a, in a more organic or, or natural way. Uh, and so I have a couple, couple things that I wanted to share with the group. Um, just as a community member, maybe as a commissioner, um, the first is, uh, that, Everybody uh, can and should, everyone in the community who's a, who's a resident uh, can and should 
reach out to um, both the, their local commissioner with thoughts on this, but also really in, to uh, Brianne, Councilmember Nadeau, um, as, as, as Danny was saying, because um, the ANC is an important, important voice for, for the neighborhood and we will uh, be providing some, some feedback onto the budget, but uh, kind of the way it works in, in the city is that the, the most, the, the, the body with that, that controls the funds is, is the city council. The, the ANC is focused on a, a set of issues that are hyper local and, and uh, among those are not uh, things like policing or, or pro uh, prosecuting crimes and things like that. And so it's not to say that these aren't things for us to talk about. We're here in this forum because we need to talk about it. And this needs to be a local body where we can surface issues, engage with the Lieutenant and other, other officials. But um, there actually is a kind of statutory limit into the amount of influence we can have over policymaking. With all that as context, um, a couple, I have a couple things that just to, to share, because uh, I also have to jump off, I apologize. Um, I've been reflecting on what people have said so far, and I think there are a few things that we, we need to do. One is, um, as our, our, our friends were, were saying, uh, Kelsey was saying, we, we want to think about reframing public safety and, and putting t uh, funds away from uh, you know, increasing funds on policing and more towards increasing investment, increasing uh, prevention. Um, so specifically, I, one of the things I noted in the budget was that the ONES office was, uh, was being cut and the ONES is, is the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. It's literally violence prevention. It's job training, it's connecting people with uh, economic opportunity and saying, you know, let's, let's just, let's avoid situations that are potentially violent rather than trying to to uh, you know, do more like lockdowns and things like that. So that's one. There's criminal justice sen sentencing reform, which is something that that uh, is really important. How do we make the the code focus on things that are um, that it should be focused on, and not on things that are just excuses to get people into the system, which is like too often I think what what we see. Um, but I but I think more broadly, and this is to some of the things that that the lieutenant was saying, um, we want to think about the protocol and the approach that our uh, police force takes. Um, the challenge is that the police force is not a policymaking body. They just have a set of rules that they follow. Um, and often those rules aren't the right rules. They don't promote the outcomes that uh, we want, um, but that's sort of like what they are there to do. And that's really wrong. And this is the time in that we're setting budget where we can put money towards things that are, that are actually important, like violence prevention, and less towards other things that are not what we want to see. Um, and I love the comment from uh, from Justin about connection with the community. And like one of my things that I think we want to see more of is officers on the beat walking around, talking to people. Uh, so maybe socially distanced, maybe with a face mask on or, you know, a face covering on, uh, but not driving around. And just thinking about how do we build a connection in, in community versus this relationship that's like from behind the windshield or even up on a bicycle, you know, it's just not, it doesn't uh, promote the kind of um, outcomes we want, which are outcomes of de-escalation. Um, and I think a third thing that's, that's uh, really challenging, so beyond like funding, beyond the protocol, what I saw a couple weeks ago uh, was federal law enforcement agencies with like assault weapons, um, you know, guarding places I'd like to walk around and hang out um, yep. because we're this federal city. And that's really challenging. Um, I am, I'm not sure what it is that, that we as, as DC residents can do in the face of like federal agencies that are, that are militarized and, and people who are being flown in from other communities who have no context on what's going on. Um, but what I do think we can do is, is, is build a set of protocols around um, how our city government and how our uh, MPD can respond in that in those situations to sort of be a, a de-escalating force or a mediating force instead of a uh, force that's unfortunately taken up with all of these um, faceless federal law enforcement agents, frankly, that don't know DC and and uh, don't understand why people are, are out in the streets uh, doing crying out, you know, for in in, in favor of, of causes that I think everyone here we all really really support. Um, and so I think there's such a complex web of issues here. And um, are you, I'm, I um, am really, really happy to, to see everyone here at this meeting. Um, and yeah. just, you know, in, in knowing how 
limited, unfortunately, our, our influences in some ways, but, but also that, that this is like just maybe the first step in a longer conversation. Um, yeah, so it's just some reflections, I guess. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing, Commissioner Winston. And I'm so glad that you could join for everyone here. Commissioner Winston's usually not on this committee meeting, so really glad he could join. And he joined me out on the street, engaging with people, handing out the hand sanitizers at the Go Go Million Mo March. So it was just, it's great to one, get involved, and then two, to a point we have in the Q&A right now with William, thank you so much for asking and wanting to get engaged. He's hoping if there's language detailing um, everything we've talked about tonight. So I think we can easily, as, a as the ANC, draft something and get that to you after our July meeting, because if we're representing the ANC, I think we need to vote on that as a full body. However, I can definitely provide links to um, people we have represented here tonight, the GoGo -Go movement, they've outlined things um, through creative, through Twitter, through Instagram, and then the Sunrise movement also has handouts and brochures that I can send to this um, attendee list of this meeting and make sure that you have access to that language. Yeah, there, there are a number of, um, we can compile really, a number of really good resources um, just that are all um, different takes on, on, on this sort of essential problem that we're confronting. Another one, for example, yep. is a, called Just Recovery DC is a Twitter hashtag. Um, I've seen a, that. It's been awesome. So, um, there's lots of energy here and I, and I feel confident um, that Council Member Nadeau and others uh, will be able to translate that energy into policy with uh, all your help and support here. Yeah, and one just wanted to open the forum to Commissioner Delaney and then definitely want to hear from Daniel. I know that you probably have similar asks to the Long Live Go-Go folks, but would love to hear. I know you all have been going door to door to the council members' uh, homes, so would love to hear more about that and uh, anything there. But Commissioner Delaney, do you have anything you'd like to say on the ANC side? No, I think uh, I think you you both have spoken for the ANC, um, and I want to make sure that Justin and Kelsey and Daniel have uh, have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, Daniel. Why don't we kick it to you, and then I can um, allow some folks in the audience to talk, and we can just kind of have a discussion as time allows. Commissioner Winston, whenever you have to jump off, no worries. Just uh, feel free to jump. Cool. Um, yeah. So as far as the bands go, I mean, Justin put them perfectly, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, as far as um, taking demands to um, people's houses, yes, we did that. So we did that on Tuesday. We went to um, Charles Allen's house and Sarah Silverman's house. Um, Charles Allen said that he would decrease funding in the budget. Um, we have video of that, it's on our social media. Um, and Sarah Silverman refused to give any kind of commitment and she burned some rice in the process and tweeted about it, calling us a distraction. Um, sorry, Sarah, Black Lives Matter and civil democracy is not a distraction. I'm uh, sorry, Daniel, do you, do you mean council member Alyssa Silverman? Yeah, Alyssa, sorry. Yeah. Um, and then the proposal for the budget actually came out um, where Charles Allen proposed a 15 million decrease from the proposal, which was an $18 million increase, which is still a net increase and not an actual decrease in MPD funding. Um, so we went back today. We're actually there now, I believe. Um, though I haven't been paying attention to those lines of communication, but um, oh, hopefully it didn't rain on everyone. But yeah, we went back today because you know he lied to us. Um, so it's, it's kind of frustrating. Um, you know, we're trying to communicate with them and we were pretty excited after our conversation with Charles and passing him on the demands of the movement. And uh, so we're just gonna keep doing that. Um, we're frustrated by other things like the, you know, we're really happy to see some emergency of reform legislation pass. We were very unhappy to see the mayor and the police not signing it or even respecting it by following what was requested in it, even though it wasn't put into law. Um, so that to that degree, I kind of just think that there's a little bit of top-down disrespect in terms of the emotions and the sentiments that are in our community right now and the lack of communication and listening. Um, you know, Police Commissioner Newsham called us a minority 
when over 50% of DC is minority. So it's pretty ridiculous statement to make to think that um, especially a place like DC that is one of the worst places in terms of policing statistics, just however you cut it up, um, doesn't need reform. It's just, you know, just disrespectful. Um, I spent a good amount of time today too looking at the budget um, and I'm not gonna like go into like any major details. I just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, the last time that the MPD didn't get what they asked for in their budget and in increasing it was in 2016. And that's when they got more than they initially asked for. Um, the past, in 2018, actual expenditures were 3% over the budgeted amount. And in 2019, they were 7% almost over the budgeted amount. So, you know, we have not just increasing budgets, but we're over budget and we also have cases where we have to take out bonds to pay for civil litigation and things like that. And those resources and money don't even show up in the budgets. So I think that we just need to very much question everything at this point um, and take the due diligence as citizens. Um, I thank everyone for being here and the commissioners, um, but to really just question things and to share this information with other people um, because you know, we're trying to communicate and work with the system and the system seems to just want to keep on going. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. I, um, Commissioner Winston, do you have anything you want to I'm just, just add? Say, um, Daniel, I uh, appreciate you, you being here. Um, could you could you send, uh, maybe send Amanda or just send, send me an email? Um, I haven't seen your organization's uh, specific sort of uh, points uh, for DC, but I would love to, love to love to read it and like and, and learn and um you know bring, bring Incorporate that. some of that into the the yeah. recommendations that we're putting together yeah yeah no we'd be we'd be more than happy to uh, to to work with you guys and try and help present move some of that information upwards and like the yeah. like i put together a budget spreadsheet going through like you know seven different years of documents where they're spreading out all the information so that it's hard to analyze yeah. so i definitely want to be able to save hassle and let other people use that information. So we'll be working on um, getting that out on our social media and making the data available for others as well. Thanks, That's Daniel. Great. And I will make sure to personally yeah. just connect everyone here with you with the commissioners. So they, as they're drafting oh, yeah. our ANC recommendations, they're able to take mm -hmm. a look at all your research. I did join, by Commissioner Winston, thank you so much for joining. Um, I did join the hub. I joined your welcome meeting yesterday and I'm in your Slack channels and everything now. So I have all of the resources and I'll make sure that we're able to have a look at those uh, before we do the ANC recommendation. Um, one question for Justin and Kelsey and Daniel. Um, it sounds like Daniel, you had some success um, <clears throat> going to, um, to Charles's house. Uh, and um, kind of stating your demands there. As Commissioner Winston said earlier, the ANC doesn't have a lot of power to um, actually make changes to, we have no power to make the changes to uh, the law. We can obviously write recommendations to the council members and, uh, and influence the, the ways that they're deciding about how to use their budget. But are there other tactics both for, um, for, for us as um, members of the community and also for the members of the community that are on this call um, that you guys have found helpful in terms of um, changing the direction of the conversation. I'll just say quickly that we've been, you know, providing mutual aid. So in that sense, we haven't been taking direct initiative ourselves. We've been joining in in other actions as requested through direct connections with those organizations. Um, so I'll leave it to Justin Kelsey to talk more about what kind of activities have been going on? Uh, we've kind of been hitting the grounds again with like the live music and just kind of mobilizing a lot of people around our demands. I feel like that has been pretty influential for us. Uh, we actually were the, was like the starting campaign committee for Janice's election. And now she's the city council member. So I feel like, you know, us using our network of mobilization firsthand and then trying to help, you know, whatever demands need to be advocated for. I feel like we found our, our route doing that. Awesome. 
Thanks, Kelsey. And congrats on Ward 4. So great to follow that campaign and just have you all involved. It's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Even to expand on what Kelsey was saying, one thing I like to focus on as well when we are mobilizing, and Kelsey's been doing a great job with this, is like paying attention to our signage and what, you know, messaging we're putting out there because we understand like how important the optics are, you know, afterwards and people really being able to digest the true message and why we're there and them being able to have their own voice heard, which is essentially what their poster is, you know. So that's one thing that we've really been focusing on. But even deeper than just mobilizing a huge crowd, we like she said, we have been taking other actions and just um, just trying to be creative in other ways. But one thing we always look to do is to intertwine the arts, arts and culture. So that's pretty much kind of like our um, our approach each time, you know. So it's not always about mobilizing huge audiences. Like you can get it done, like like Daniel said, going to someone's house or whatever, whatever. You know, it's other all different ways of of advocating, lobbying, or having someone, you know, really get your message. But um, I think that it's, it's important to to keep a certain energy when you're doing so. I think that's what makes it more attractive, you know. So that's just what we I can want. Order. Music and art are a great unifier. I agree. I feel like, not even I feel like, you know, music is the glue, but also like the, like art is, like art is, is so important right now. Even if you look at like all the murals of Black Lives Matter, whatever, whatever. I mean, we can have other messaging as well. I think it's just about being more intentional with what we are looking for and really expressing that. So that's my two well, cents. Thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing. And um, I know you are super, you guys are super busy. So um, taking an hour out of your night tonight to come talk to us was really valuable. And thanks a lot for doing that. Yeah, thanks for having us. We truly do appreciate it. And we're always looking to build new bridges and create new relationships. So, you know, we always- We're here for you. Let, let us yeah. know how, how we can help you exactly. out. Exactly. Without a doubt, likewise. Perfect. Cool. Well, I do want to just open it up to the attendees here. I'm going to allow everyone to talk. Um, feel free. You don't have to talk. You're not pressured, but definitely. Um, let's make sure here. Okay. So I have everyone on here allowed to speak. Would love to hear, just kind of open it up to the floor, what you heard tonight. We heard from NPD, we heard from Long Live Go Go, we heard from Sunrise Movement. So excited that we can convene this conversation here. Um, would just love anyone to jump in, say what you thought or anything you'd like to add. You can also feel free to send us messages on our website as well. Yes, and I will be sending it, as I mentioned in the chat, sending an email just as follow up to everyone to make sure, um, one, you have the recording of what we talked about tonight, but two, we'll send all those links and resources and even contact information for folks here that allow me to share it. Any questions, just jump in. No wrong questions, no stupid questions. Okay. <laughs> I know that some of you guys have questions, but that's totally fine. Nobody has to speak. Um, I do know that I was down uh, protesting. A lot of my friends have been sending videos and I think it's hard to, especially that we're in the district, we're in the capital of our great nation. It's hard to distinguish, okay, people are pointing that finger at somebody else right now. And I thought the Lieutenant did a good job tonight of trying to portray the MPD's stance on things while still obviously having that lens of, of it, we're the best. And it's like, okay, you're the best, but everybody can get better. So I think that the message tonight is that there's a lot we can do. And from this conversation, there's so much that everybody has to bring to the table. So really the only way through and the only way better is together. So I think that's something that we can all kind of contribute to. And every single person counts, as Danny said, contacting the council 
member and contacting the committee that has the oversight and the vote on these things, that's really what's going to move the needle, in my opinion. Great. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, and um, hopefully we'll see you next time.